you, Betsy, Thank you and thanks for everyone um, coming. Uh, I definitely went with the invitation to, uh, well, some of what I'm presenting here I've presented before and I feel confident about, especially to the descriptive material, I decided I, I would uh, end with some things I'm really struggling with uh, and that this group in particular could help me with that. So. Uh, what I mean by this title, From Big Brother to Little Mother, is going to become apparent, I hope, uh, by the end of the talk. But for now, suffice it to say uh, that the broader stakes of my talk are to think about two forms of tracking. I'm going to focus on one. I think the people in this room are more familiar with the other. Um, and I see these forms of tracking also as forms of regulation, forms of power that coexist in contemporary society. And I want to think about how they might be related to each other. Um, so on the one hand, you've got uh, something here in this CCTV image that is uh, metallic, cold, threatening. It, it appear, it's looking out. It appears out to get you. It's all seeing, all powerful. Um, and if you update it to kind of accommodate for, try to find a way to visually represent, and I'm pulling these uh, you know, from, from online stories on the NSA, NSA scandal, uh, et cetera, when you try to update that image uh, to represent the sort of sneakiness and the invisibility of that gaze, you still have this, this human eye, which is creepy. Um, and even in cartoon forms like this, um, which, which also captured the idea that you are, you are being watched and you may not uh, know it. You know, you're, you're being spied on. So even when it's a cartoon, there's something creepy about it, right? It's this, this idea that we are at its mercy. Meanwhile, I'm, some of you may know what this, does anybody know what this image is? Okay, so that's, that is Little Mother. It is actually a product called Mother, um, and I will tell you about it a little bit later. Um, and it's just sort of serving as a way for me to characterize um, and tentatively draw a, a, a differentiation between these two modes of tracking. It may be that I end up feeling they're not that different. Uh, but for now, I want to uh, propose that. Uh, so this is plastic, warm, cute, caring. Uh, it has eyes, but it's smiling reassuringly, um, non-threateningly. It's the, the sense that it intimately, it, it is not seeing you as much as sensing you. Uh, through sensors, quite literally. So it's, it doesn't come across as being a spy. Um, and here it's, it's pictured as actually doing, doing a little dance. So I want to try to make sense of these, the, the, how, how these two modes of seeing, of scrutinizing, of uh, modes of power, in a, in a broader sense, might be related. Um, and I think the past decade, I'm sure you would agree with me, has seen a lot of public and academic conversation uh, around the big brother side of things, uh, from the NSA scandal to Facebook mood experiments, uh, et cetera, and heated debate over the ways that governments and corporations track, uh, track us, collect data on citizens, on consumers, the ends to which they use it, and how this might threaten civil liberties. And those are all things that I care very much about. Uh, in fact, here's an image from my own research on uh, casinos, quite intensive behavioral tracking systems that in many ways, um, well, that quite literally predated, it, it was way, way ahead of the game and could do uh, so many of the things that then Amazon and Google went on to do and, and the internet. Um, so so I, I delved deep in my first book into the kinds of real-time data tracking and response to consumers. But again, you're being watched, there's a bubble you're being looked at. Um, so. Then we have this. So even as this debate over surveillance monitoring uh, is unfolding, the public is also embracing practices and products of self-tracking, applying these sensor-laden uh, patches and wristbands and pen pedants and you know, using apps to their own bodies in the name of self-care. And people have, of course, long used technology uh, for self-care uh, to record and reflect upon and regulate their bodily processes, uh, use of time, moods. You can think of uh, mirrors. You can think of diaries. You can think of mood rings, right? Thermometers. There's a whole set of technology. But in the past five years, there has been this dramatic efflorescence of 
self-tracking with the rise of digital technology and the smart, owing much to the smartphone and having this capacity uh, in our hands, in our pockets. So it's not just the spread of mobile technology, but also the increasing accuracy, portability, affordability of sensor technology, uh, and the increasing sophistication of analytic software um, and algorithms. So we're offered this increasing array of gadgets that are equipped to gather real-time information uh, about our bodies, our lives, convert that information to electrical signals, and then run it through algorithms that are programmed to reveal insights and inform uh, interventions into future behavior. And there's a whole conversation to be had there about um, algorithms, which is one I've participated in and I know um, has, has been aired here with numerous visitors. Um, I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A, but I'm not going to really be going into the, the work of those algorithms um, when it comes to self-tracking today. Uh, and I want to say, of course, all of this is part of Big Brother 2. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but it is also a form of self-care and self-regulation. And I want to just, uh, let, let's sort of pretend, we don't, we don't know yet, that this mode of self-care and self-regulation might be something different within the larger field of tracking. Uh, so my question is, what insights could we maybe reach if we stop and explore that mode of self-care, which here I'm calling for shorthand um, little mother instead of uh, big brother. Uh, so just to back up and kind of follow the trajectory of my project as it evolved. So it started out, um, I knew when I left my a uh, casino gambling addiction technology project. It was called Addiction by Design. Um, the last piece of field work I did for that and the last chapter I wrote, although it's in the middle of the book, um, is called Live Data and it really was a, a, an exploration. It also delayed the publication of my book because I felt like I had to include that. So I waited a couple of extra years as these new casino tra data tracking technologies were emerging because I thought it was a really important piece of the story that I was telling about the this intimate relationship between the consumer experience, in this case of addiction, and the design of the technology. Um, and I left that project feeling that I wasn't done with that story of tracking and exploring um, the way that data is increasingly being used uh, to modulate our experience, to inform our experience, to shape our experience. However, I did feel after years of studying the casino industry, somewhat uh, just defeated by uh, looking at consumer manipulation. And I felt like I just need something that at least has the potential uh, of, um, some other kind of story. So quantified self popped up and I said, maybe this is it. Let me just go and go and see. So I started attending meetings. Um, I probably don't need to elaborate too much for this audience on what quantified self is, but it, it's an international collective of individuals. I think last time I checked 45,000 members in 40 countries who are ascribing to this quest for self-knowledge through numbers as in the tagline you see here. And so this is an ethical project, ethical in the philosophical sense of uh, using numerical metrics and statistical correlation um, as a route to the good life. And so in online forums and meetings, uh, quantified selfers share their attempts to experiment with things like diet, meditation, kindness, drug side effects, a whole range of things, and try to make correlations between you know, hormonal fluctuations, mood, um, even evaluating semantic content in, uh, in email correspondence for clues to stress and, uh, and unhappiness. Uh, here's just one image from um, Meta uh, Dryberg, 2.5 years of my weight. Uh, I gained a lot of insights from this heat map. So this is just one little small piece of the, the, the kind of visualization and insight that emerges from quantified self. And the ethos here is very do it yourself, citizen science, take charge of your own data, design your own tracking system, um, et cetera. But over the, five, uh, the, the last five years, I think we've seen an increasing turning of this once fringe phenomenon into a mainstream phenomenon. And that has happened through the so-called quantrepreneurs. 
uh, who even as I was beginning to attend meetings, you would see more and more of them sitting in the backs of the rooms and the sides of the rooms uh, of quantified self meetings who were there um, to capitalize on what they were hearing in these rooms. Um, so startup culture basically, venture capitalists, startups, electronic companies, um, trying to glean from QS ideas for new products, et cetera. And so now uh, we find QS-like apps and devices in places like Best Buy. This is quite out of date, but even here a few couple of years ago, 143 matches uh, just in the category of distance traveled. Uh, Amazon, uh, at the end of 2014, launched a specialty shop for wearable and then kind of broke those down, smart watches, smart glasses, running watches, et cetera, family wearables. Um, uh, at the time, uh, when it went online, it, f it featured around 800 products. I haven't checked it lately. Um, the ma vast majority were under fitness and wellness. And what was interesting is that I'm not sure this is still up here. It may no longer be needed, but initially there was this sort of pedagogical orientation offered to consumers to help them think about um, what would you, what, how might you use wearable technology? How might you incorporate it into your life? Why could it be valuable to you? Uh, and of course, these giants, Apple, Samsung, Google, Microsoft, have all recently introduced uh, health and fitness tracking systems. This smartwatch, here's, um, I believe that's the Microsoft band. Uh, this device can know me better than I know myself, help me be a better human. Um, so echoes of the ethical project, um, but also echoes of surveillance there. Um, Apple and its... Uh, health kit or the care kit, uh, as it's called here, um, Samsung's S health apps, et cetera. Um, and I'm just putting this up because I always get the question of, uh, are people actually using this? And if they're not, why do we care about this? So um, I think it is too early to tell whether wide scale self-tracking is gonna come to pass and stick. Uh, and there are studies showing that mainstream consumers, you know, not QSers, but mainstream consumers are not using wearables consistently uh, or as intended. Uh, but it is the case that people are purchasing uh, uh, these apps, uh, these gadgets, downloading wearable, uh, downloading apps, buying wearables in rising numbers. Uh, and you see tech companies dedicating increasing resources to developing these. Um, so it's still very much alive and going. Policymakers, insurance companies, optimistic that these technologies are gonna help mitigate lifestyle diseases. Often um, these digital health summits are framed by um, Obamacare and how that opens new opportunities. Um, drug companies hoping that this will find, this is the holy grail to solve this problem of uh, medication compliance. So there's a lot of hopes being pinned on this, both within uh, the tech industry, um, and also if, if the buying of these devices and the stocking of them in these consumer venues is any indication, hopes also on the part of consumers. So I think that that investment, even if it is just a promise, a hope, uh, is telling of certain anxieties and needs, uh, and uh, important to, to look at. So I've been trying to uh, get at those anxieties, those needs uh, through field work over the past couple of years with users and with designers of tracking technology. So I've been spending time um, in places like this. This is the Consumer Electronics Show um, held in, in Las Vegas every year. Uh, and here you find uh, increasing floor space and now a whole kind of separate expo within the larger expo dedicated to this kind of personal tracking technology uh, that can help people to manage mundane uh, aspects of human existence. Um, sitting, moving, uh, stepping, eating, drinking, even breathing. Uh, are, are at stake here. So I'll show you just a few of these. Um, so here on the back is the, gives you a sense of the scale of the Fitbit booth um, at Consumer Electronics Show. Um, and I think I'm actually gonna turn off my sound so I can talk over this video. So this is a, um, an advertisement for the Fitbit, which is the, the market leader still in wearable fitness, uh, showing how your decisions can add up to a healthier you. Um, 
So you've got uh, the camera following these users. Uh, at one point, we're going to see a, uh, a woman playing in her backyard uh, with her children. Here, here's a, there she is. Uh, then you see these kind of imaginary, these crisp imaginary lines going off of her wrist uh, through the window to the smartphone and laptop. And it sort of suggests that she can trust the device in the background to be capturing the information she's generating. Um, and then here you've got this guy facing this real choice. Does he walk or take the subway? And he, um, he decides that he is going to walk um, and add these, these potential 2,000 steps. Um, and here I like this part because you've got these kind of data rings uh, kind of radiating out from the feet of this runner, um, sort of giving you this sense that there is all of this data kind of um, around you that you are radiating, that you are generating, um, et cetera. And then it, you know, it closed on the image of a sleeping woman, suggesting that it, you can optimize even inactivity. Uh, and here, um, on the inactivity note, this is a competitor, Jawbone. Um, some of you may use the idle alert, uh, which also addresses inactivity by vibrating uh, when wearers are still too long, and you can kind of set it. Uh, as some wearables focus entirely on bodily stillness, so this over here is um, a simple little gadget called the Rise, which sits in your pocket, and it records time sat throughout the day. Um, Lumo Lift, uh, which really uh, went on the rise. Um, this was an update from a Lumo back. Uh, now the Lumo Lift is this tiny little uh, kind of chip that fastens on your uh, brazier strap or your lapel, and it records and corrects your posture, again with uh, subtle or not so subtle vibration. So here's, um, through the app, you can control when you're buzzed, how you're buzzed, how intensely you're buzzed. So it is a little, it's a little self-shock, uh, kind of benign cattle prod um, type of technology. Uh, and it also performs uh, standard tracking, but its primary purpose is to regulate these kind of stationary uh, states of sitting or standing. And I'll just read all about your posture, all about your life. One move changes everything. And there's a, there's a promotional video where uh, there's a corporate meeting and uh, the wearer, this woman, pauses briefly, briefly to lift her head and she kind of brings her shoulder back and then uh, the whole mood in the room changes and people look at her as if she has a little more um, authority and she kind of smiles and it says small changes can be empowering. Um, and then here is the uh, happy fork. You know, we've been through stepping, sitting, standing. Uh, the happy fork modulates, measures the activity of eating. Um, so it's a smart utensil. And the way it intervenes in the habit of feeding um, is by recording the length of the meal, the number of fork servings, and the time between each servings. And the time between each servings is the real critical part. That's where it acts on you because if um, it's shorter than 10 seconds, then the fork oscillates so that you know to slow down. Um, and I'll, re I'll read to you here from the literature. Uh, you are advised to take about 10 to 20 chews. If you trigger the happy fork's alarm by eating too fast, don't panic. Set the fork down at the side of the plate and wait until the light turns green, signaling it's safe to take another bite. Um, so it really, you know, it manages, we can laugh at it and mock it, and it has been laughed at and mocked, um, like Stephen Colbert, he, he called it very un-American because of its effort to slow consumption. Um, and, you know, and people have pointed out it addresses such a first world problem. It is problematic in all sorts of ways, but it manages without having a sense of irony to you know, print up this product literature in which something as routine in a single bite of food becomes a matter of potential danger and wor words like safety are being used. Uh, and it's being presented as this everyday technology that lets you take control of your health. And it, it encourages you against the advice of um, actual slow, uh, slow food movement to, to have your device not in a basket away somewhere, but right in front of you as you eat in your other hand so that you can, uh, you know, as your data uh, is being collected, as you feed yourself, your own data is being fed back to you is the idea so that you can kind of see it. Um, and here's the sort of data that you can 
look at um, number of fork servings, duration of a meal, and you can go through your days. You know, it's, it's not that different than so many of the apps, th this particular app. And here's the kind of alert that you'll get if you uh, next fork serving in six seconds. Oops, too fast. Um, Okay, and then hydration. I mean, I just wanted to kind of to cover some of these really basic human uh, uh, aspects of existence. So this is, this is another, um, drinking. Uh, we've got a whole set of different technologies here. Um, I'll approach it in slightly different ways. This is the WaterPal monitoring device. So it has a small, it's a small wireless scale, scale that you can put on the bottom of any bottle and it'll keep track um, using an accelerometer, et cetera, um, of how much liquid is consumed. And then it sends it to your smartphone. You've got this little image of a body being filled up like a bottle. Um, then we've got a different technology that uses what it calls passive hydration tracking um, to, with these built-in sensors, and it will adjust your goals based on the temperature, the humidity, et cetera, and it gives you feedback um, not through your phone, but with flashing lights. And here we've got one, um, the Illumni, which, which changes color from red to yellow to green throughout the day, to let you know where you are at with these preset hydration goals. So I'm not gonna go on with more technology. We've got a lot of examples um, on the table. And I wanna pause and ask, uh, although I will get to mother in a moment, um, I wanna ask what, sense we can make of all of this, uh, th th this as a mode of self-regulation. What kind of self-regulation or regulation is this? Uh, so in my, the part of my field work that's with the design side, uh, the, the selves of self-tracking, and I try to get, get at that directly and indirectly in my interviews. What is the, what is the model of the self that is being, that is at stake here in this design? Um, these selves are being modeled as choosing agents. So they're being constructed as consumers whose well-being depends on and derives from the market choices that they're making. Uh, and you know, in, in my world, in academia, choice making, much has been made of choice making by a number of scholars as being a distinctly valued and fraught uh, domain of life in advanced liberal uh, societies. And we are urged to shape our lives through choice in the manner of sort of savvy, ever vigilant entrepreneurs of ourselves. Uh, but more often than not, we lack the knowledge, uh, the foresight, the, re the resources to, uh, to navigate the abundance of potential choices we face. And so then you'll have a psychological literature talking about decision fatigue and the paradox of choice, et cetera. So, uh, th there's a lot riding on these little tiny mundane choices. And you can see choices of what, you know, what to eat, how many bites, um, how long to sit. These little choices in time about your own behavior um, fall under, I would say, that this idea of choice making and responsibility. So the wearable tech industry is kind of banking on the double insecurity I just laid out. On the one hand, um, you are exhorted to be self-managing and responsible. On the other hand, you feel quite lost in a sea of some temptation and sometimes toxic choices that you are in no way an expert on. Um, so the customers here at stake is, is really unsure whether to trust his or her own senses and desires and intuitions as uh, you're sort of walking through the metaphorical um, supermarket aisle of, of daily life. Uh, so really things you would think of as, as learning when you were a child, um, when and what to eat and drink, when and how much to move or rest, you know, real, again, really basic aspects of existence. We, we feel that we're flying blind and that we need help uh, as we navigate through, um, through our days. And so the, the, the pitch on the part of designers and marketers, the appeal is that this technology offers both a way to embrace the project of self-enterprise, but yet w without undertaking or bearing the burden uh, or being too overwhelmed by this tedious, nebulous, anxiety-provoking work of self-management. So it's promising to fill in the blind spots, take the guesswork out of everyday living, and kind of supplement your own intuitive sense of being in the world with, with this continuous statistical 
informatic kind of um, mode of knowing. That, that it's a mode that, unlike you, can compute how small choices, here we have, this is a Fitbit ad, I think that's the Fitbit, uh, I forget which one that is. Small daily decisions add up to um, big, big results. So how small, tiny, seemingly silly things like the number of bytes or seconds between bytes become consequential you know, through, through repetition. And I think this, this idea of consequentiality is not simply one that is an anxiety on the part of consumers. It's an anxiety on the part of the healthcare system when you look at how much of the budget is spent on so-called lifestyle diseases, um, having to do precisely with these tiny little choices that then will add up through repetition to become heart disease, diabetes, et cetera. Uh, so these, these sensor technologies are being offered um, as, as a kind of digital compass. This is how I was thinking about it um, in my research, a kind of digital compass for modern living that, that helps you navigate. She's looking down at her compass. What should I do now? Do I walk to my car? Um, do I leave my car here in the parking lot and walk home? Who knows what she's thinking? Lunch. Uh, she, uh, she, she's looking at this compass with a sense of, um, of hope and the being cared for. So what I've noticed in the past year or so, um, I thought, you know, that's, that, I, I like that digital compass, right? But I've noticed that there's been a shift um, just in the past year or so um, that I've detected. Uh, it may have been emerging before that, but for me it came together um, going to these meetings, talking to designers, um, looking at the, the, the kind of their internal debates um, in the world of tech. And the idea is that tracking technology not only can, but in fact should, in fact needs to do more than give people self-knowledge and perspective. So there's been, if you even look at the advertising rhetoric, a shift away from learn about yourself, listen to your body, gain insights, which is sort of a direct translation of quantified self, right? Uh, there's been a shift away from this attentiveness that's being encouraged to your micro rhythms and your choices. Um, even a, even a, a, a move away from this, asking someone to stop, halt, and have a moment of reflection and engagement with information, there's, been, there, there's a shift away from that, um, I would say. Um, and I'm calling this um, a shift from compass to thermostat. And so thermostat is becoming um, the new metaphor, um, although sometimes it's, it's so literal that it, it, you could say it really, these are real thermostats when it's um, talking about um, you know, earbuds that sense if your heart rate's going up and then pulls calming music automatically from your playlist, music that's been shown to calm you down in the past. That, that's essentially a thermostat, and that extends to a whole host of different technologies. Um, so I've got a quote here from um, someone who I, I like to quote because she's both a longtime self-tracker and a technology designer, Leslie uh, Zeliger. Um, I forget where she said this, probably South by Southwest, but um, we're, we're on the brink of really exciting things, devices that monitor things and then give you actionable updates before you even need to ask. Uh, so she, she really welcomes the opportunity to outsource and automate to the greatest degree possible the labor of self-regulation. Um, so she goes on, I don't want to track. I want to have it done for me. Insert a chip in my mouth and have it record the calories for me. The, con the customers uh, in that, if, you, if you're thinking about that as, as, a cust as the customer that device makers are increasingly imagining, um, instead of being an active choosing agent, uh, you could say, I'm playing around with this idea of passive choosing agent. So choices are still at stake, uh, but instead of these subjects aspiring to responsibility and autonomy, they are tired, overwhelmed, a little freaked out, anxious, and they wish to outsource um, this labor of self-regulation. So what this, uh, what this trend amounts to, uh, this trend toward automated self-care um, is really a move away from where I started this project. And I didn't expect that, but uh, it's a move away from the ethos of intensive self-attention, the kind of ethical project of who you want to be in the world and how do you want to live your life. 
Instead, there's this increasing automation of that, of that labor, or you could say of that project, and then you can ask, is it any more an ethical project in that sense? So the idea is that a deterrent to, to passive or frictionless devices rather than active, uh, where self-reflection is kind of unnecessary rather than essential, and where self-regulation becomes a function of algorithms rather than of intentional um, action. Um, so <laughs> by offering consumers, uh, and here you see, so coffee, Coke, um, gambling, I didn't even notice that till I'm sitting right here, so very fitting with my past work. Uh, but these, all of these gadgets, or you know, put, put these little thermostats on, help us be your compasses and, your, and increasingly your uh, thermostats to help you with this existentially taxing work um, of self-management. So you could, uh, you know, going back to the Fitbit ad, you could imagine a sort of future iteration of this ad because Fitbit is often uh, what's criticized because Fitbit's whole platform was giving you information about yourself so you can change yourself. They're moving away from that, but others still say, you know, that's the problem with Fitbit. People, and that's why people don't use it. It just gives you information, you look at it, but it doesn't actually do anything for you. We need, we need more interventions, buzzes, vibrations, shocks, alerts, um, nudges. So you could imagine in a, in a future advertisement, um, not only does the protagonist run carefree in the backyard, um, but can, and not only does she trust her devices to track her, so that she can look at that information later. But she trusts them to keep her on track. And this is why I'm calling my book um, Keeping Track, because it's not just about self-tracking. There's a weird waning of the self. It's about keeping on track. Uh, so that would look like interrupting the flow of her experience with something that she's wearing to prompt her that it's time to eat or drink or, or rest. Um, and here you see Mother, so I've built up to this. And this product almost too nicely captures, I think, this, this externalization of responsibility to technology. Uh, it's playing on that in the advertisement. Um, whatever you need, whenever you want, Mother knows everything. So there's this, this all-knowing mother who will intercede to quench your thirst before you, don't, you, you even recognize your own um, thirst. So let me show you a little how this works. It's also called the, um, the sense mother. So it's not a seeing mother, it's a sensing mother. And so the sense mother using these motion, uh, magical mother sensors or otherwise called cookies, um, what you do is you put them uh, on your keys, on your water bottle, on your medication bottle, on your you know, exercise bike, um, I affix a sensor to the bottle. It encourages me to drink when I forget. Um, and so here you've also got um, your, your dashboard uh, on your phone where you're, you, you choose to allocate, the, to delegate these cookies to different areas of your life where you really want a, to be mothered. And then you can check in with your phone um, if you wish, but you don't have to, right? Um, and so I think it's worth maybe... Um, showing the video here. So there's a phone call from mother uh, saying it's time to take your pills. Um, so you get the idea of how this works. Um, so, you know, moving, moving to my final 
I don't know if I want to even call them reflections, questions for you to help me think through. Um, you know, I've sort of had my head deep in uh, figuring out this, trying to make sense, you know, especially in conversation with uh, people who use these technologies and self-trackers, which I'm not talking so much about here. Um, I've been trying to figure out this logic of <coughs> self-care. Um, but I thought what you could help me think about, which is something that um, I, I feel I, I have to, that's a critical part of the story, is how this, this story of self-tracking and its increasing automation um, fits with the other story that's running alongside of it, which is um, a, a story of how our, our anxieties around being tracked, being tracked by our employers, by our government, um, and so on and so on, and yet we are moving to this kind of self-care um, as well. And I think in this story, a certain ambivalence around what is a self how autonomous is a self, how responsible is a self, comes to, to the fore, and what, what, what you see is a real need and desire to be guided, to be, um, to be sensed, to have feedback, not to be a, a firewalled off kind of bubble, right? Um, but that, how, how do we square that? How do we square, um, you know, this kind of, the, the anxiety, the, the desire to be guided, to be nudged, you could say, alongside the desire not to be surveilled and taken advantage of. And are there connections to be drawn between uh, this, this ambivalence we see in this story and the kind of debates and possibilities for resistance, right, uh, to governmental and corporate surveillance? And the, the, yeah, the possibility for resistance. So going back to the opening slide, um, and at this point, I'm kind of thinking out loud before I open it up. But you know, how do we think about the relationship here? Is this relationship dynamic? Is it reinforcing? Is it contradictory? Uh, how do we make room for and make sense of little mother's sense from within the criticism that I think we've developed very nicely around Big Brother's gaze is essentially what I'm what I'm asking. Um, and you know, some of you may be saying, well. One obvious way in which these things are linked is that you may be, this may be about self-care, but actually these gadgets are uh, recording all sorts of stuff about you and passing it on to others. So, uh, well, before I put this up, so this is mother. I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd put this up here. So obviously it says, control information. You don't want mother or the cookies to record certain things push the pause and delete it, uh, free, and then only you, with extra news. Uh, all data generated um, by devices you buy is yours, only yours, period. At any time, you can, of course, choose to delete all your recorded data. So there's this very, again, this very comforting, comforting kind of uh, narrative here, whether or not we believe this. So I'm not here to debate, is this true or not? There's, there's other people who could do a lot better job of investigating that. Um, but it is clear that the little mother way of seeing is absolutely implicated in the big brother way of seeing. So the, the field of everyday analytics suggests that, um, you know, supports a, a plethora, obviously, of political aims and intentions that go beyond self-care. And even as we are practicing voluntary self-tracking, uh, that data is being used or potentially used by insurance companies, factories, schools, workplaces, healthcare facilities, and it's open um, to hacking potentially. So it puts, a, it puts us at risk, you could say. And um, here's a Symantec, uh, they put out a report and I'm quoting here, they found security risks in a large number of self-tracking devices and applications. Um, all of the wearable activity devices examined in this report, including those from leading brands, are vulnerable, for example, to location tracking. 20% um, of the fitness apps examined um, transmitted passwords in the clear. Uh, a staggering 52% um, did not make available their privacy policies, according to the report. Um, so on and so on. So certainly there is reason to go right there in answering my question. Um, but I would argue that there's still something that remains um, important to contend with, uh, which is that, you know, al al although that is going on, what, what's there still to contend with is that uh, th this, this is so wrapped up in your sense of self 
And what's at stake is this desire you have. The reason that you're buying this and using it is that you feel you need this help and you want to be guided, you want to be nudged. So how, again, do we think about putting those um, together, those two kinds of, they're, they're, that's the ambivalence that I would love your feedback on. Are there connections to be drawn um, you know, between this, this larger, between Big Brother and and Little Mother. So I could I could go on, but I actually think this is a maybe one more one more slide because somebody that I've found useful in starting to think about this question is the um, a philosopher named Colin Koopman, and you may have read uh, this is from 2014. This is from 2016, maybe or 15, um, in the New Inquiry. Um, so he writes about this idea of info politics. And what he's arguing is that we do ourselves a disservice by um, using the metaphor, an optic metaphor, by comparing this to um, a panopticon, by, by even calling it surveillance and talking about a gaze. What we're missing in that are these intimate mo kinds of sensing in this new mode of of uh, power, you could say, and he's calling that infopolitics. And he says this works differently than disciplinary society. We need to update our analytic models uh, and really try to characterize this mode of power um, if we want to um, resist it. And I, my feeling is that part of that resistance has to uh, take into account what people are wanting and their anxieties around navigating everyday life and choices. Um, to do that. So I've, I will stop there and open up for questions. And I've got to stay, I'm sort of staying here because I didn't want to put a giant headgear piece on, so. <laughs> So a fellow entrepreneur raised some questions to me that I think might fit in your question about bridging. Uh, so he's looking at developing a sensor-based technology for elder care that, that I think he called it pharmaceutical compliance, which is, you know, you take your pills on time. Mm -hmm. So obviously el older people don't want to go into assisted living. And so he, he presented two questions to me that I didn't really have ready answers that, that I throw out. One was, he pointed out that there's a correlation between high credit scores and behavioral, I mean, and pharmaceutical compliance or behavioral, successful behavioral modification. And so the question he was posing is like, how do we protect against data flowing back the other way? Like it's just too tempting to resist. Uh, so that was one question. Uh, the other, and that- because Just, I just to pause on that, there's an interesting link to be made with um, casinos as well, because what, what mm -hmm. casinos are doing in this area is trying to circumvent laws that say you can't change and change the odds in the middle of a gambling session to provide sort of a personalized experience that's dynamic that's dynamic so if you need a little boost or something it will give it to you and it can sense your desire for a certain kind of volatility and the idea is that banks and the financial world is going to be seeking information on uh, what kind of volatility preferences and thresholds do yeah. these people Plus, have? It also, the, I mean, insurance premiums is another example of right. there's such a core, there appears to be this correlation, you know, in these different disciplines. Right. So that's <laughs> one area of concern he raised. So that's, that, that to me is big brother meets little mother. Um, the other question he was asking is whether, you know, because there's so many schools of thought on behavioral modification, he's thinking about how do you make this not com so completely automated and presumptive, but give people a way to engage and interact with a, the solution to modify it for a particular elderly person, which she thought might introduce opportunities for kind of visibility or transparency in how it works that protects against unethical uses? And I wondered if you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's a, the whole question of autonomy is so difficult. I mean, another way that I could have put this, um, you know, wh why I think um, it's important to put these things together is that often when I read you know, the excellent work that's out there on this side of the, the equation, there is, there's a presumption um, that the ideal model is autonomy, privacy, 
that you want to be secure, have a secure boundary around you? And then how does that fit with real human needs and dependencies, especially that are especially salient in the case of children, in the case of elders? Uh, and so how do you put those together? I don't, I don't, have, I don't have the answer. Um, and I don't know that it's simply finding like the middle point between you know the right degree of autonomy or non autonomy and dependency, or if it's something else. Um, so you kind of threw my question back at me. So I don't <laughs> um, hi, Natasha. So I have one question for you, which is so so it seems like what you're trying to posit at the end is that there is like the sort of paradox or like discontinuity between like government surveillance on the one hand and this sort of self-surveillance on the other. And I wonder if maybe part of the reason that discontinuity exists is that like the objects of the surveillance are not the same. In the, so you've posited that they're both the self, right? But actually like the people who feel the most adverse effects of government surveillance are not rich white people who are going to CES and like investing a bunch of time in self-tracking, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I feel as though like the quantified self yeah, I agree with you that the quantified self sort of ethos has infiltrated society more broadly, such that anybody who has a cell phone or a smartphone like basically has some of these capabilities, you know, in the devices that we carry around. But I, I think what your research would probably bear out is that the people who are most devoted to this kind of way of like this epistemic like mode are people who are likely not like people who are getting put on the no-fly list, right? And so it's not clear to me necessarily that we actually are talking about the same objects or that. Um, like the effects of the surveillance are necessarily comparable in that way. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, I do think, though, that as this moves out into the mainstream, away from the super privileged Silicon Valley uh, techno elite, you do see it going to, uh, you know, call it the middle class, call it the mainstream. Uh, people who are going to, uh, to hospitals, to banks, to schools, students, we're all encountering this. Uh, and what's, what's emerging as that stuff goes out is in a, is in a weird way a uh, turn maybe back to other modes of, of surveillance that you could find. There's a sort of meeting uh, you know, in, in welfare offices, in uh, more, more obviously biopolitical disciplinary kind of modes of power are sort of meeting this, and, and maybe that's partly what's going on here, this, this quantified self ethos of DIY, take charge of your own data. And there are these uncomfortable attempts to kind of mix them together. Um, I, you know, there's many ways to answer, to, to, to think about who is this affecting, but I do see it affecting an increasing number of people um, from different walks of life, uh, whether, whether you're an employee, uh, a factory worker, um, a participant in, a, in a, a developing world's public health plan that uses cell phones. Uh, so I don't know if I want to shut down too fast that conversation by saying that this problem only applies. And I don't, I don't think, I wouldn't want to characterize your, your question that way, but I would hesitate. I want to kind of leave open that this does in fact affect or have the potential to affect um, quite a lot of people out there and it's, it continues to grow. So. Yeah. Hi, um, so thank you for this great presentation. Um, I have two questions or one question and one comment based on your last question. Mm -hmm. um, the first question is, so, you know, in, basically you show that people use these technologies to kind of improve themselves, right? And, and I kind of wonder about, you know, in broad terms, like when would you, why, when did it become a thing to improve oneself, right? To become an entrepreneur of oneself, right? To constantly track and improve how we are, how we, how much we wait, how much how we look, et cetera. And, and I think like in economic sociology, there has been a lot of work on, on entrepreneurial um, ideology, right? But, but you're showing that at a more personal level. And so, I was wondering if you could kind of talk a bit more about, about the kind of cultural categories that underpin the whole uses of technologies that, that you're showing, right? Um, the second question is about your, your final thing, and it's more, I guess what's really interesting is that you show this contagion of numbers, right? That's kind of what you're, you're seeing here, mm -hmm. with both for kind of 
oppression or surveillance and resistance or something like that. And, and so in my work, I look at analytics in the workplace. And what's interesting is that I see exactly the same kinds of contagion uh, in the sense that analytics that are originally developed to control other people, like the clients, mm -hmm. the audience, the readers, uh, the public, then turn into the workers themselves or turn against the workers themselves and are used to measure, compare, and usually decide on compensation or you know, adjust compensation for the workers. And in the case in journalism, in the case in policing, uh, in the case in many different areas where analytics become turned against the people who use them, basically, to control other people. So it's this kind of, Karen, you also see that in your work, right? But uh, there is this kind of contagion aspect that we see in many domains, and I think that what you're showing might be part of the same story, mm -hmm. perhaps. You're calling it a contagion? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, I think actually you can, you can look back in so many kinds of workplaces and see it already there from the get-go. I, I mean, I, in, in an undergraduate class I'm teaching now, I, I put together, um, there's a great piece by Tracy Potts on, that talks about the, the kind of efficiency and productivity uh, and makes direct, I, I read that alongside some Taylor scientific management and the students are able, you know, these undergraduates are able to make these direct so I think there are many templates there. I don't know that it's a contagion of sort of marketing logic and measuring the public. In fact, it, it went that way from the workplace um, before marketing and public polling opinion uh, kind of research and surveys uh, ever existed, right? So the, the history of quantification um, uh, run, runs deep there. But it is, it is interesting to think, I mean, it, it, with regards to this conversation, um, absolutely, what we are using to care for ourselves, in this case, is precisely the same streams of data. It can be on the same devices that our employer might use against us or our insurance co company might use against us. So that's a direct, that's almost like a parallel story of two kinds of regulation, two kinds of care, but the device is what is doing the work on both sides. So. Um, your other, your other question, um, the, the sin, so where was, where was that coming from? Just Were you detecting that um, in the scholarly world there is this sort of knee-jerk reaction against anything like self-maximization and management? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's there, but what I'm seeing is not so much optimization and improvement. I think that's definitely there and you see it a lot in the way that these, even in advertisements, and crush your goals and compete with your friends on Facebook. But the kind of tracking that I'm uh, looking at, this sort of mundane everyday tracking, is really less a less entrepreneurial self-maximizing. It's about um, keeping yourself on track and maintained. It's maintenance, it's not maximization. Um, so that, that's really my entry into this. And I think a big mistake, so, so how I criticize my, um, my colleagues um, in this conversation is this whole phenomenon of self-tracking, I think, gets too quickly slotted into a ready-made analysis of neoliberal society and the increasing outsourcing of what, you know, social welfare to us. It's in our pockets. We have to do it for ourselves. And then the story's over. Uh, but as an anthropologist, talking both to the designers who try these things out and to uh, the, the users who end up with them, um, what that doesn't account for is the, the, the huge, again, anxiety um, and uncertainty around uh, how one should, should live, what you should do, how do you stop you know, willpower, um, autonomy, how much of it do you want, how much of it don't you want. It isn't a happy story of a self-maximizing sort of CEO of oneself. In fact, even the CEOs designing this stuff will you know, maybe a ways into our interview after they've moved past the, the sort of promo rhetoric will say, you know, it's weird, but... Um, you know, when I, when I, even though I'm beta testing this and I designed it, when I go to look at um, my data, my heart rate, I've noticed kind of rises because I, I'm really afraid of what it's going to tell me. And so all of these, you call them infantile, like call them human 
uh, worries and anxieties emerge, even in Silicon Valley. So that, that's sort of something that I want to do too, is break apart a little bit this too easy narrative about, um, so you get it, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm just seeing, um, you know, in the same way that I think people will often say, oh, I'd do anything to lose weight. It's anything except, you know, all the things that you need to do to lose weight. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like, um, you know, this is kind of substituting for that. It starts off as I'm going to get motivated to go run. I'm going to get motivated to do this. But actually what I really want is this thing that won't, make, won't let me do this and that will make me do that so that it's not up to me anymore. It's this device that's making me do it. Um, another thing I'm just thinking is that I, I think people, when they think of government surveillance, they think it as us or, you know, they're doing something to us. They're surveilling us and we don't get anything out of it. Whereas I feel like when people are using these different devices, they're seeing it, oh, this is my choice. I'm choosing to purchase this thing. It's being marketed to us in this particular way. It's really cool. It's newfangled. It's a shiny device. Um, and so I feel like it's a really going to end up normalizing the idea of tracking ourselves. And then you get into, is it ethical for me to track my elderly parent to make sure they're taking their medication? Is it okay for me to track my children while they're at school to make sure they're going out and you know exercising during recess? Um, is it okay for me as a donor to track people in my development project and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing to achieve my behavior goals? Um, you know, and I, it just brings back this, I, I lived in El Salvador for a long time. My mother-in-law used to keep chickens in the house, and when she first got the chickens, she would tie a little string around their foot and attach the string to something, and after a while, she would cut the string, but the chickens wouldn't go anywhere because they knew, according to them, they couldn't. So that's kind of the, what I'm seeing here. Right, and I think that that chicken metaphor is, is, is a good one because I think this is, a, this, this is about a desire to have some kind of tethering and to feel safe and guided and cared for, because certainly she was caring for the chicken, right, with this little leash, but then also not to be enslaved and uh, um, sort of controlled too much. I mean, that, that really is what, what is at stake here. And in terms of being controlled too much and how we're gonna get accustomed to that or it's gonna become normal, um, you, you started out your question talking about what we really want might be um, you know, something that just makes us do something, doesn't allow us to um, put any options back on the table or slip in any way. And so you, I didn't talk about them today, but um, there are some technologies that even go beyond mother, like Pavlock. You may have heard about Pavlock. So it's a play on words with Pavlov. And um, the, the maker of it, um, what it is, it, it, you, you wear this band and you can... Um, it can, you can set it to zap you, and it actually delivers quite an intense, it's not a subtle, nice Apple Watch kind of zap. It is a pretty, you, you jump. It's a shock. Uh, and he had the idea for this because the only solution he came up with to stop frittering time away at work, going where he wasn't supposed to go, rescue time didn't work, was to hire someone to sit there and slap him uh, when he did that. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a kind of sad and extreme story of the, the, the kind of need to be regulated, but certainly there's, there's a desire for some kind of benign policeman, or, or there's a desire for a certain kind of care, and I don't know that we have the vocabulary for that care, because it quickly sounds like we want a mother, or we want to be infantilized or taken advantage of, and I think it's partly a problem of not, not having the vocabulary to articulate between big brother and, and little mother, the, the, the kind of care that, that, that is called for here, so. And I think that's all we have time for. Okay. We have time for one more question. Oh, I thought we had to end at 1.15. Oh, here we go. Great. Um, so going back to the, I, this idea of this being the CEO of oneself and the preoccupation with this being about um, the kind of entrepreneurial self who is responsible for um, equilibrium. I was wondering about how uh, self-tracking might also create sort of the opposite effect because it sort of makes you hyper aware of how sensitive 
bodies are to the environment and that they are in constant osmosis with the environment and they can be, you know, anything can like disturb your stress levels, you know, the constant traffic of food coming in and out of you. So I was wondering ways in which, uh, like the anxieties about control could also be reversed where somebody could say like, my environment is making me sick, my workplace is making me sick, and having this sort of uh, self-tracking being a kind of membrane or like eardrum that like, you know, records the rhythms of, you know, the sound waves or the outside environment on your body, like it's writing kind of on your body. So that was, that was sort of my... Yeah, I mean, some um, of the earliest uh, tracking stories that were in the news of, look, there's this new breed of quantified selfer had to do with that that kind of tracking, so figuring out, um, you know, through mood tracking uh, throughout the day, either randomly or at set intervals, um, checking in with you, and then you correlate that to where are you? Are you at work? Are you on the phone? And then, and then these surprising revelations um, that you know, I'm happy as talking to my ex-boyfriend, and I'm really stressed out and unhappy talking to my new boyfriend, or. Um, I think that was Kashmir Hill, journalist who, who wrote that story. Um, and then there, there's the, the, the work, someone who thinks they love their job but then realizes that they don't. So it's sort of like the, the data is cluing them in um, to, to the different ways in which the environment is, is the problem. And then that empowers you to make a decision about your environment. That's how the, that kind of story um, gets told and you can, uh, you can take that to a collective level, I think, also, when you think about the environment and imagine, as people are already doing all sorts of political collective action for these kinds of technology, even using existing technologies that are intended for individualized self-tracking um, for these um, other kinds of goals, like using your, your um, ambient pollution kind of monitors on your individual trackers, but then pooling them and using those as the basis for going to City Hall and saying we need policy change on this neighborhood, et cetera. Um, so, so the potential uses are, are there both for um, a turn to the environment in relation to yourself and a turn to the environment in relation to broader structural and, and collective um, kinds of issues. And then I think the other aspect of your, your question um, comment was about the oversensitizing you and uh, or maybe I was reading that in but that that is it a problem that you're too aware um, of all of this and does it always have the effect of making you calm and confident as you go about your day or would it actually make you panicky and freaked out um, to see this, that all of that radiating, to have a sense of all of these things um, that are potentially toxic or harming. And absolutely, I mean, I think the narrative of equilibrium and uh, the desire to achieve that uh, is, has its own truth, but, what, but when you actually, when it comes to using these devices, um, in, in my conversations with trackers, I rarely find that it happens so, so nicely and neatly. And there's a lot of panic, sort of ob obsessiveness about the data, feeling that you end up being um, kind, of, kind of a slave to the, to the alerts, even the sort of nudging kind, so. Okay, that's all we have time for, so thank you so much for thank you guys. fantastic data bites. <laughs>